Um, welcome to Wards 4 and 7 NPA meeting. It is a pleasure to see you all. It's a pleasure to be fed tonight. Thank you to Domino's Pizza on North Avenue for donating a pile of pizza. So awesome rock and roll. Um, we're going to get started. Thank you to our neighbors. Um, we always start with introductions and ground rules. So why don't we just start real briefly by going around the room with introductions. I'll start. My name is Matt Probert. I live in Ward 7 and obviously I'm on the steering committee. And I'll go to the closest. Yeah, my name is Lee Morgan. I live in Ward 7 and I am on the steering committee and also on the Parks and Rec Commission. Over here. I'm Olivia Taylor. I am sure. Ward 7 and on the steering committee. I'm Jeff Clark, Ward 4, and the steering committee as well. Yep, Philip Peterson, and I uh, work for Public Works. I'm here to present, and actually, uh, <laughs> I live in the New North End. Norm Baldwin, uh, Public Works, uh, City Engineer. So the mic doesn't project in the room. Uh, Norm Baldwin, uh, City of Burlington, Public Works Department. Is there... I think we might want to explain So the mic is for Zoom. Oh. Um, right. It doesn't project in the room. There you go. Oh. Thank you, Jeff. So, Ch Chapin Spencer, Director of Public Works. <clears throat> Stephen Hamlin, Ward 7. Sandra Gazo, Ward 4. <laughs> Nancy Strong, Ward 4. Shannon, Ward 4. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Martha Frank, Ward 4. Art Frank, Ward 4. Amy Payne, Ward 4. Amy Bielowski Branch, Ward 4. Frank Bozek, Ward 4. Frank's wife, Ward 4. <laughs> Chris Aisley. Uh, Ward 3, uh, Church Street Marketplace Commissioner. Robert Bristow Johnson, and I'm in Ward 7. Let's use a different mic. Send that one back. Send that one back. Nancy Comstock, Ward Send 7. That microphone all the way back. Oh, Jeff Comstock, back. Ward 7. Uh, Sarah Carpenter, Ward 4, City Councilor. Yeah. Oh. Brian Tim, Ward 4. Sarah Hernandez Tim. Ward 4, and I'm also the new Public Information and Community Engagement Officer for the Burlington Police Department. Oh. Hi, Scott Rogers, Community Development Manager with CEDO. Peter Ireland, Ward 4. Oh, do we want to go this way? There we go. Ali Jang, City Council, Ward 7. Mark Barlow, City Council, North District. I'm Colin Larson. I'm pretty sure I'm in Ward 7. <laughs> I'm Dan Castragano, Ward 4. Jesse Warren, visiting from Ward 5. Tevin Goldberg, also visiting from Ward 5. Carol Odie from Ward 4. <laughs> Sal Millichamp, now Ward 7. Martha Mulpas, Ward 7. Did we miss anyone? I don't need that. My name's Robert Depper, Ward 4. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Robert Depper, Ward 4. Maybe we can go to our Zoom audience. I lost the video. We can see you, brother. Okay. Am I up? Am I up? You are up. Uh, Bob Hooper, uh, remote from Pennsylvania. Um, awesome. Representative uh, with Carol and chair of the retirement board. Thank you, Bob. And I believe that we have a microphone or a speaker working in the room now. So we'll keep on moving. Um, we have always ground rules, and I was not prepared to 
speak tonight or lead tonight, so I don't have my fancy one, so I'm just going <laughs> to wing it um, <laughs> in our little sheet in front of us. It's just a reminder for ground rules to listen to others speaking, respect the agenda, respect those that are speaking, share your opinion politely, and treat people respectfully. And I always do remind people that this is being recorded by Channel 17 and broadcast via Zoom, so there's a record. It is difficult to do that. Yeah. Okay, and is, so is that not working? It, it won't project, so. Can we? Yeah, you need to speak up. Okay, I need to hold it. Okay, so we're gonna start with community announcements. Is there anybody present in the audience? Sarah, I saw you um, first. I just, we've all gotten notices. On Thursday, June 1st, 4.30 to 6.30 is the meeting for the comprehensive planning around Letty Park. And I encourage you all to go. They're really looking at a lot of interesting things and different things. They've had several planning sessions, but it's getting more serious. I think at four, if you go on Front Porch Forum or the Park Department website, um, you'll see it. I think at 4.30, if you let them know, there's hamburgers and hot dogs. And at 5.30, they're going to kind of walk through the planning process. So please try to attend. Thank you. Someone else? <coughs> Gentleman in the back. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Tevin Goldberg. Um, and as I said, I live in the South End in Ward 5. Um, I am, uh, together with my roommate colleague here, Jesse, uh, we run an organization called Democracy Creative, which is located in the Soda Plant building uh, down on Pine Street. And we are a uh, design lab for democracy and community meeting hall um, that is working on a number of kind of fun projects trying to make democracy more accessible, imaginative, um, and effective. Uh, and so one thing that uh, I'm trying to get the word out about. Uh, we've been going to every NPA. We're almost done. Uh, <laughs> uh, to uh, announce this uh, information session that we're holding in City Hall a week from today on May 31st at 6 p.m. Uh, it's about citizens' assemblies. Uh, and this is an idea that has actually kind of grown a little bit out of the NPAs because uh, fairly prominent thinker on the subject uh, is Terry Baricius, who was a uh, city councilor here in the 1980s and kind of got the NPAs going uh, back in the day. Uh, he's going to be talking along with another expert on citizens' assemblies. Sorry, am I being gestured at? Increase my volume, okay. <coughs> uh, I always, it's... Things are doing something with it. The for this. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know, yeah. Um, so to get to the point, um, you may have seen there's some flyers out there uh, by the sign-in sheet. But anyway, we would love if uh, as many people as possible could come because we're very enthusiastic about the potential of citizens' assemblies to address um, a lot of problems with democracy and uh, particularly representation of people because they work with uh, random lotteries. So that's kind of the big difference between them and an NPA. So attrition is the fancy word. And uh, <laughs> some people like it, some people don't. Uh, but anyway, you can come and decide for yourself uh, on uh, 6 p.m. a week from today in City Hall. Thanks. You'll have to come. The mic doesn't go any okay. further. Hi. Take a moment and remind the room of our friendly rules to respect everybody's announcements and opinions. May I make one more announcement? Oh, I think oh, Martha's going to speak. Martha, in. and then there was somebody else in the back, but we'll come back to you. I just want to report that Heineberg Center had its Walk of Ages last weekend, made over $5,000. So thanks for the community support. And there's donations. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a hand before we go back to Sarah over here someplace? Well, my, I think Sandra. Sandra Gazo, my concern getting to City Hall is my safety. 
I'm very uncomfortable approaching the, the building. So are we going to have security guards there if we want to go to this meeting? I mean, is somebody going to be there so that we can get from car to city hall safely? I'm sure other people feel the same way that I do. I think Sarah was. Um, in the vein of Heinerberg, I just want to announce that it's, I put it out on, on our Facebook and my Facebook. For the next uh, four, thir uh, four Thursdays in uh, June, the Heinerberg Center is having a series on how to manage aging, things like moving, how you manage all of that, what are your options, what are the legal options. So look on Facebook or look on Front Forge Forum. It's, um, Thursdays, uh, 6.30 to 8 at the center. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan Castrogano. I live in Ward 4. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that yesterday at the airport, we had over 30 people at a rally that I helped organize with a group called Safe Landing BTV. And one of our demands is to immediately ban private jets at the airport because of wealth inequality and climate injustice. And so um, Charlie and Town Meeting TV were there yesterday, and uh, I'm looking forward to the City Council's response to our demand. And so if you want to get involved in that campaign, that's safelandingbtv.org and at safelandingbtv on social media. Thanks. My name's Sal Millichamp. There's a block party, June 10th, Cambrian Rise. Um, come if you can. Everybody? One more? Nancy, right behind you. Gentlemen in green. Uh, Chris Hansley with uh, the Church Street Marketplace Commission. I'm wearing a couple hats tonight. Uh, Marketplace uh, did, Commission is not recommending any increases in the common area fees or the downtown improvement district this year, so that will be coming as a formal recommendation to the council if it has not already arrived. Uh, I am one of the three resident commissioners on the Marketplace Commission. I live in the heart of downtown on College, above Patagonia and the Archives Bar, right in the heart of everything. Uh, I'm particularly interested in hearing from people who live in Burlington about anything that may be on their minds regarding the Marketplace, everything from public safety to accessibility to snow removal and anything in between. Um, and then one of the other hats that I had worn right up until a few weeks ago is I was on the ad hoc committee for reappraisal. Uh, we delivered our final report to the City Council on May the 1st. Shortly before uh, we finalized that, uh, the state decided to wade into that, so uh, there may be some action there. Uh, but I'm hopeful that moving forward we will have a better process that does not result in uh, people getting really whacked here um, on their taxes. So I'd encourage you to check out the report if you've not had an opportunity to do so. Thank you. I just had a request for anyone to respond that it might be the gentleman that spoke about the event that's at City Hall. Someone had a comment in the audience that was concerned about their safety. Yeah, I can, I can try to answer that. Um. So uh, we, I, we're not going to have security there, but uh, there's often p a police presence right at the base of Church Street these days. Uh, they'll park police cruisers by there. I can inquire about maybe seeing if they can be there at that time. But uh, in general, I mean, I'm I'm on Church Street all the time, and I, I think you'll be OK getting in. Um, I mean, you might have to find somewhere to park. Uh, but yeah, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll think about that. We honestly had not really considered um, security for the event, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Without further ado, we're going to go to Ali and then move on. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one more. Ali? Um, just a question. What time is the time we arrive to 10? 10 to 2. Okay, thank you. And one more. Thank you. 
Martha Frank, Ward 4. I just want to echo the concerns about City Hall Park. I had relatives visiting this weekend, and there was no police presence, and it was not a very comfortable place to walk through, so I would really welcome more dialogue on that subject. Thank you. Thank you. I see no further hands. So I'm going to grab the reins. We're going <laughs> to move on to our first conversation, which is potholes, patches, and plans. And I will pass the baton to Chapin Spencer, our director of the Department of Public Works. Great. That's a good idea. I'm trying to figure out where I can sit to uh, approach. <laughs> That's probably to fine and project. Like Great. Uh, thanks for having us tonight. Uh, I'm Chapin Spencer, director of Public Works. I'm joined by city engineer Norm Baldwin and Public Works Engineer Philip Peterson. Uh, it is great to see so many NPAs have food. As many NPA meetings as I attend, dinners may be a thing of the past at my house. So thank you. Um, so let's see. We wanted to quickly provide an update, thanks to Bridget, uh, who uh, invited us here about this year's paving and uh, patching and pothole strategy. I know uh, we'd all agree in this room that Burlington's roads are not perfect, correct? <laughs> great. I'm here to explain what we've been working on. It's great to have the full new North End City Council delegation here tonight as we work through balancing resources and priorities to make the best decisions with the resources we have. So, next. There we go. Report in 2016 for the Sustainable Infrastructure Plan in the first water resources water main and sewer main replacement effort. And as you can see in the chart here, uh, sorry, we can go back that uh, paving numbers have increased in terms of mileage. Uh, most years since 2017, we've been able to double the amount of mileage. Sidewalk construction nearly triple uh, the mileage. Uh, and previously we had not had dedicated funding for replacing or rehabbing water and sewer mains. Next. So our work is largely informed by you all, our plans that we put together, council and community input, the funding we're able to secure, uh, intergovernmental coordination, if there is an electrical upgrade uh, underground or if there is a uh, water or sewer upgrade, and also private development. If there's a major development, we want to coordinate our investment as well. Uh, I think we all understand that uh, there are challenging headwinds with funding our infrastructure. Costs uh, for all of us have gone up. The city is no different. In the top right, you'll see the price of asphalt has gone up far faster than inflation. Uh, I am pleased this year we were able to get uh, competitive bids for paving. We had three bidders this year. The last couple of years, we've only had one. So it is an effort on our part to get a bid put out on the street that will get as much attention as possible. I'm pleased this year we got a number of competitive bids. Funding is obviously an issue. Uh, voters were generous again in 2022 to support a smaller bond, $23.8 million bond. It only budgeted two years of paving support, which was last year and this year. So next year is going to be another tough year especially with the high school, which limits our overall ability to bond for other items. Um, and then federal infrastructure dollars, everybody hears that uh, there's been a, a infusion of federal funds. Unfortunately, routine maintenance of paving is not uh, an eligible activity for those funds. Uh, so uh, we are on our own to make that happen. And lastly, climate change, the freeze-thaw cycles, which we've all seen, water getting into the pavement and then freezing pops pavement. It's not our friend. Thanks. So thank you, Chapin, and uh, thanks for letting us present here tonight. Um, so here's just kind of a brief overview of paving specific to the new North End. 
So since 2017, we paved approximately seven miles of streets in the new North End. Um, and in that same time, there's been approximately 20.7 miles of paving citywide. So it's about a third of our paving resources have gone towards uh, pavings. Uh, I would say one effort that's pretty specific to the new North End is crack ceilings. So the streets in red are streets that we've dedicated quite a bit of resources in uh, preventative maintenance. Uh, crack ceiling isn't always like the most fascinating or interesting thing that we do, but it is very good uh, effort towards preventing problems. Um, here's more of a specific breakdown in terms of new North End paving history. As you can see, by year, there's been some major efforts towards new North End paving, um, and then other years less so. Um, we do have a data-driven process that informs our work. Uh, last year was a pretty heavy new North End year. Our paving for this year, uh, we have two streets left over from last year's contract, uh, Birchcliff Parkway, which is a South End Street, Flynn Ave, um, which is also a South End Street. Um, other streets that are part of our 2023 contract would be Clark Street, Pearl Street, Riverside Avenue, St. Paul, Walnut, um, and then other contracts, the SRF work, which is state revolving funds work, the water main work that's happening on Lakewood and Tallwood, and then work that's happening on Champlain Parkway. The state is also doing some class one paving. You've probably seen them on Minuski Avenue, Shelburne Road, uh, South Willard Street. That's a continuation of work um, from last year as well. And here's a breakdown of our current patching plan. So these streets, uh, the streets that we've chosen are, they're patches, but I would kind of categorize them as smaller paving uh, projects. Battery Street, the northbound lane, I'm sure you guys have all driven on Battery Street and can see the delamination and rutting that's happening in the northbound lane. Uh, the Beltline ramp near Manhattan Drive, uh, also some rutting and delaminating. Colchester Avenue near the Medical Center, uh, Pine Street near Maple and Pine Street between Queen City Park Road and Home Ave. Those are all streets that um, are kind of getting our attention. And the reason that they're getting our attention is because they're arterials. They're highly traveled streets um, and not just um, local, local roads. We do have some next steps that we're undertaking. Um, Norm Baldwin, myself, and uh, one of our senior engineers, Corey Mims, have been meeting over the past couple of days to develop a plan to collect some data. Uh, we have um, several engineers that are working together to collect data on streets without, within the city that uh, require patching and to prioritize kind of a patching plan. We're hoping to have that patching inventory completed um, by August 2023. And that's everything from your basic small isolated pothole to the entire intersection on the street should be taken care of, but maybe not necessarily the entire street. Can I think you know, can I a little bit of that? And that is, um, I think the thing that catches the most attention for us is when you see a series, when you see a series of potholes together in a cluster, and it's 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 a challenge for you to traverse that section of road. So there are roads that are reasonable shape, except for that one spot that everyone knows and sees and is troubled by. And uh, our biggest concern is is that okay, how is this going to fare through another? winter free saw cycle that we're we're experiencing through this process and uh unfortunately there is so much so much funds that we have available and uh we're just trying to make it stretch as far as we can and, and if there's given what we have for limitations we're gonna seek to pursue other funds to kind of ex enhance or improve what we're already in in play and that is a perfect segue uh norm into this slide here where we are trying to find additional funding uh, in partnership with the counselors. We're only able to pave about 1.3 miles ourselves uh, with street capital funds this year. The state's helping, this, uh, the water work is helping. Uh, add to that for a total of six miles citywide, which is a significant uh, number this year. But we're gonna be looking at uh, previous year's paving contingency as those projects wrap up and FY24 street capital tax rate. The voters have authorized uh, a greater tax rate than what the budgets in past years have, uh, have needed. And so there is opportunity to modestly increase the street capital tax rate, which will be a conversation that we will need to have 
with the city council in the next few weeks. Should additional funding be able to be secured for FY24 uh, in evaluating the uh, scores of North, F, North End streets, there will absolutely be an additional new North End scope of work as part of that enhanced work. Thanks. Uh, so tentatively, uh, on our list for a paving contract for 2024 is North Avenue. We've applied for what's known as a town highway grants or VTrans class two grant. Um, application was submitted back in March to secure funds to do paving on North Ave and Stanford Road from North Avenue to Oakland Terrace. Both of those streets are definitely on um, our plan for uh, CY24 paving contracts. So responding to potholes, we know that there are uh, issues out there and we want to be uh, responsive. And you'll see here that C-Click Fix really is our predominant tool. Um, street maintenance, our service level uh, goal is to get to all potholes within two days. And uh, we also can take, if there's an urgent issue that either has caused damage or may cause damage, our after hours and weekends phone number is accessible 24 seven and we have crews on call that can respond nights and weekends to that work. Uh, we also store asphalt over the winter so that we have hot mix to work with in addition to the cold patch. Cold patch is a, a winter time uh, material when the asphalt plants aren't open, but as people have seen, it doesn't stick the same way and it's not as durable as, uh, as hot mix. So next slide is uh, how to reach us. Uh, the customer service line here, 863-9094 is a number that you should have available to you. We have a email and the construction portal if folks have gone online is a great tool for seeing what work we have and capital across the city has uh, for this coming year. And I uh, would we'll just say uh, the last piece is Vermont Alert. The number's wrong. It, it, the number's wrong. Great. The number up there should be 9094. As I said, we will fix that in the PowerPhillip, um, yeah, thank this, you. This, this uh, presentation will be provided to uh, someone on the MPA so that you know you all don't have to. Yeah. And then Vermont Alert. Uh, who here has signed up for Vermont Alert? Excellent, good, your neighbors are. This is a really important tool in terms of if there are roadway closures, if there are water disruptions, any urgent items that need to be communicated. We have over, uh, I believe 9,000 people in the city who are signed up to the statewide tool. Great communication tool. We'll keep it short at that because I think the community conversation is gonna be the most important part. Thanks so much for having us. All right, thank you very much. We have questions. Uh, you have many people in this room from Ward 4, the Apple Tree Point, Strathmore, uh, and beyond. The 2024 tax reassessment, did I hear correctly? Do you want to just elaborate, <laughs> please? It's an effort to generate funds through an increase of a tax base. So this... We are exploring all options for trying to add resource. Uh, as you heard from Philip, we're writing state grants through the town highway program, et cetera. One potential consideration is that as part of the overall tax rate, it's made up of a general fund tax and then individual dedicated taxes. One of those taxes, you know, there's penny for parks and others, but one is the street capital tax. Our understanding is that the uh, rate that has been authorized by voters has not been the full rate that the council has approved budgets for in the past. And that there is a modest amount of an additional tax rate that could be authorized should the council in reviewing the budget uh, find that additional paving and patching is a wise investment given where we're at. So that's part of the FY24 budget process to discuss and to decide together. Good to know. I, I have a question. Um, I think, Philip, 
Yeah, um, I think you said, I think I heard you say since 2017, um, you've paved seven miles in the new North End. Um, are any of those miles duplicates? It, it seems like North Avenue. Well, North uh, Avenue is a pretty big street, so it's broken into sections. Right, so we had done North Avenue, so from Sherman to North Street in 2021. And wow, what other section? They're, they're not duplicates. They're I think not. to your question, it's, it's everything in the new North End street grid plus Route 127, which was paved, paved a number of years ago. Happy to break it out street by street later if you're interested. It just, in my head, time flies and it seems like yeah. North Avenue has been. But what is the life expectancy of, or, or is that too vague? The hope is 20 years. 20? Wow. I mean, that, that, the way that we design streets now, so if I'm looking at a street and like a pavement thickness and how long we want it to last is we would like them to last up to 20 years. Okay. It's a function of soil condition. Traffic. Commercial traffic. That's a big one. Uh, and uh, the climate. Drainage. Drainage. So there's a number of factors, but um, you can't <clears throat> say definitively each street's going to be X years. And, right. and a lot of what you find in the city is Unfortunately, in the era when streets were redeveloped, they didn't have a great sub-base. So that would require us, if we wanted a good structural sub-base, to take the whole street down at least 18 inches. It's very expensive, cost prohibitive. So we're, what we're doing here is we have a shorter life cycle of these streets in order to kind of at least have a rideable surface and have it spread among the system. Um, worth noting, the system is 96 miles of roadway to be maintained, so it's not inconsequential in terms of the cost it is to maintain that system. And if you compare against 20 miles that's been complete versus 96, you can see uh, in that period how we're making progress. But it's but progress is is in many people's minds not to where we want to be, given that some of the some of these streets. So we we see that, understand that, and we would love to see more resource, but we're we're in competing in those interests of other needs the city has. Thank you. There was somebody in the back and then we'll oh, yeah. circle back around. Hi, uh, thanks, thanks for coming. Um, uh, if this is a little too off topic, feel free to let me know and I'll try and talk about it later with you all. Um, if we were trying to identify as a community some points um, in the new north end to make more progress on the walk bike plan from 2017 i know we've got the letty park project right now um, what sort of solicitation process would we go through to try and like initiate a project you know i know you have uh, plattsburgh and north ave on the 2024 plan if you're doing a repaving of that you know would uh, um, an intersection redesign be on the, the table even if you know we could put together some kind of low-cost pilot program obviously you know I want to be cognizant of the financial restraints that the city's under so we have a senior transportation planner on on staff Dayton Kreitz I don't know if you've met Dayton or um, talked with him but uh, we have a long list of transportation projects we want to complete and our goal with that is to uh, leverage other people's money to complete those projects if you have something that's not on that list that he's maintaining, we certainly have a conversation with him and and uh, see how what our next steps would be to you know, address what your concern or your your interests are. We just uh, we got a grant for uh, Sherdy's Path connecting uh, here over to uh, to Ethan Allen Parkway. There are a number of other projects underway. The Burlington Walk by Council would be a good advocate, uh, good outlet for kind of your interest and engagement and happy to continue to have the conversation we're proud of the progress we made but there's still a long way to go in the front and green yeah um, well martha oh sorry yeah. oh, martha yeah. okay. Okay. are you sure um, yeah, we'll throw it over after <laughs> okay <laughs> um a number of years ago the street department went to the algorithm theory about addressing needs this was a while ago um i think it was in the last 25 years and we didn't use algorithms before that now the algorithm arrangement for or the 
theoretical arrangement, um, lists for Burlington streets to be repaved every 20 years and the sidewalks 50 years. Um, I live in an area where the original sidewalks are still there <laughs> um, and they are breaking apart and a couple of them have, sorry, have been fixed. But I guess my concern is, and maybe you can address it, maybe you can't, what about the streets that don't last 20 years? Do, does that, but then they become really bad. Where does that fit in as far as repairs go? Well, the streets yeah. that you're probably referring to are really probably heavily traveled commercial truck traffic right. streets that don't last a 20 year cycle. Residential streets typically would, given uh, they don't have the, the commercial traffic. If you, if you follow some of the technical pieces to uh, maintaining a street, truck traffic, commercial traffic, does 10 times the damage of a passenger vehicle. So that's a substantial impact if you look at major arterials. Those are typically the streets that you'll see that commercial traffic on and uh, suffer quickly or go out of service quick, more quick than, say, a residential street. But that's not to say residential streets are unimportant. It's just how far do we make the money go and what is the greatest impact in terms of making a, a system serviceable, right? So if there's 20,000 cars on this street versus 300 cars on this street, how do we make that dollar go as far as we can in terms of being serviceable to the broader public? Do we just try and patch it out until 20 years goes by, or how does that work? Well, we're not fond of the patching solution, but it's, it's uh, patching is a means to provide a serviceable street in the balance of use of that street. So if you had a reasonable condition road and you had one segment was like, oh my God, I gotta drive through that every day, mm -hmm. we would try to focus on putting a small localized patch to it. Now, we understand that if we came next year and did repaving, we've lost the value of that work in order to repave the whole street. So we're trying to be strategic about where and when we do these patches relative to the longer range plan of significant work or repaving. So it's a very hard balance. Think of it as a very low cost speed bump. <laughs> <laughs> you don't no. spend any money on it. Yeah. Uh, if, if that's what the community wants, then we can, we can easily accommodate that. We've got time for two more questions. Okay. Okay, hi, Martha Frank again. I live on Cumberland Road. I've lived there about 33 years. Um, our street has never been repaved, and Art and I have counted 30? Well, 30 potholes. I will speak together because yeah. I don't want to take up the time. There's 32 <laughs> potholes between 70 Cumberland and 90 Cumberland. And we keep patching them. And I, again, I appreciate all you doing. This is not a criticism. Sure. I understand the issues. But you just mentioned people zigzag for six months through these potholes. Sure. There, and you mentioned a, a section of the street. Maybe we can just fix the section instead of keep patching. We've been patching for five years. And I, I just hope that we could, you could reconsider Again, not a well-traveled road, but you have to see people weaving in and out, and people that live there understand that. But Including folks on bicycles. And I do want to say that we did have it patched, I think, about a week ago. And we, we had called the city a while back, and about a week ago, and it's all coming up again. So just so you know, I, I don't know what the cost analysis is between having folks come out every single year paving those little spots and then coming back in. It would be interesting to see what the cost is. We also watched the people fill the holes. It was done rather haphazardly. None of those holes were cleaned out. There was just some asphalt thrown on it, tap, 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 and off they went. And it's literally all coming up again. We do believe our street is hollow. If you take a stick and you poke it, all of our neighbors think it's hollow. So thank you. Yeah, I would just say that uh I've driven your street, I'm familiar with it. I actually drove the network uh, a week ago, and uh, my biggest concern is with some of these streets that were developed by private developers, they weren't developed in a way that you would follow a standard practice, and were substandard in, in, in their road section, and then their sub base. And as a result, they don't live or last as long as you would reasonably expect. It doesn't live from year to year. And so, you know, for those streets, my, my belief is that we need to do what they call potholing. In other words, we would find a localized location, cut out a square, 
excavate, identify how much asphalt you have, how much sub structural subbase you have, and make and prepare ourselves for what cost it would take to properly restore it to something that is reasonable. In other words, if you had, say you have poor subbase and there's not a lot we can do because that's just way beyond the co reasonable cost, but we'll, if it was, say, an inch and a half thick of asphalt, asphalt. Yeah. that's not enough. We typically have at least three inches for residential streets. So these are the kind of things we're looking at. And yeah, it's a technical detail, but the, you, you need to have context, I think, to understand that. Please look that. at it, because I know my heart is in the hole. We joke about it. Yep. I, uh, I was recommending that we do some potholing there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to jump to Zoom. Bob Hooper's been very patient. Uh, question? Two questions, actually. Um, one, where Gray Meadow intersects with the street that is not Luado, but it comes straight down, that's been patched a lot of times that I have seen, and it also just comes right out. Uh, and the people that live there right on the corner, because it used to be a dead end, uh, take a fairly good exception to it. But, Spencer, my question goes back to when we uh, redid North Ave. Uh, in the project that gave us the bike lanes and went down to two. Who is responsible in the city for quality control? Because it, as soon as that job was done, and it looked really nice, uh, the first rainfall, the, the driest place on the road was where the drains were. Uh, everything else was an inch or two deep in standing water, which uh, hastened, uh, at minimum, the collapse of the surface. Um, uh, how are we making sure we're getting what we're paying for? I can try Because we didn't do that. So, um, North Avenue itself, we had, had a deep dive focus on drainage on North Avenue from, I guess, Ethan Allen to uh, Shore Road. And uh, there's some complexity to that drainage system itself where it wasn't draining within the subterranean elements of the of the system of conveyance and uh, the street is extremely flat and had no crown and I don't know if you're referring to before that work but I drove that coming here and yeah there is some bird bass at edge of road near driveways because the driveway cuts but generally is is been draining successfully so I'm not sure what section you're referring to but uh, we have primarily had in, primarily in the area of the co-op, uh, the bank up through that that section, yep. and on the uh, east side, more than the west. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Well, we did some drainage improvements on that west side last year, okay. and uh, it, to, to North Point, my understanding is that drainage has been performing much better than prior. But we can take a look at the east side as well. Ali, did you have your hand up? Last question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's more of a comment, but also I'm going to add a question. I just wanted to say, you know, yeah, that this is this is this is not easy from the perspective of an elected official. The contact information they provided here, I think you should add your city councillor. Your city councillor as a point person to connect with them. And I just want to be really appreciative to Chapin, Norm Baldwin that's not here, and you know who I mean, your communication person, because they have been very responsive. And no one now in Ward 7 is complaining about roads, is complaining about sidewalks, right? I think. I'm not saying that all the city councils are not doing their jobs, but what I'm saying is we are elected also to work on the streets, to drive on them, to identify the issues, and to fight for those issues to be solved. I think it's an important element. One thing that I wanted to say is North Avenue, soon you will hear, we will need your engagement. We received a grant from the uh, CCPC, CCRCP, in order to look at North Avenue, comprehensive plan, re-envision North Avenue. If you drive your cars, 
just look up the, the electric poles. It makes this neighborhood so ugly, and we need to put them down underground. We need to put some more arts. We need to put better trees. We need to put better lighting. But that's not the work of Chapin. But that's the work of the voters. If we need our neighborhood to be beautiful, and soon you will be contacted to, to um, engage into this conversation. What are your hopes and dreams for North Avenue? Right? But I really wanted to say thank you so much, um, whoever invited them here today. Because Bridget, thank you, Bridget, for bringing these people today. Yes. Um, they done great work. If you go to Franklin Square, if you go to Eaton Island Parkway, but I just hope that we fight for what the new North End deserve. And that fight can't be done without the people that you elect to do that fight for you. Thank you, guys, and keep up the good work. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Spencer, you guys did great job. Thank you. Feel free to call us anytime. Happy to yes. serve everyone. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yep. Thank you. So All right, we're going to jump right in. Let me introduce <laughs> for a community discussion about needles and parks, our own Lee Morgan, who is a Parks and Recs Commissioner. Yes, thank you. We're going to jump right in. Um, I want to make sure our Narcan training has the full allotted time. So what I'm going to do is I have a little presentation. And then if there are, I might have a little time for questions about process. Um, if you have comments about this topic, please connect with me afterwards. I'll also be giving you folks my email. Um, so we want to make sure we're sticking to our time. So my name is Lee Morgan. I live in Ward 7. Um, I am a Parks and Rec Commissioner. And I have dug into my first big project on the Parks Commission. Um, so I think we all know that uh, improperly discarded needles are a problem in Burlington. They're, they're kind of everywhere. They're concentrated in some areas, um, parks and um, streets. City Hall Park's a particular problem, but they're, they're pretty much ev everywhere. Um, and after, you know, what I've observed, uh, also looking on uh, C Click Fix, which I'll be coming back to and in, in seeing um, some of the tracking of the needles and also hearing people speak at different public meetings. Um, I've decided that this is a good task uh, for my role in the Parks Commission. Um, so this is important because for a lot of reasons, um, it's, it's really a public safety issue. We, we don't want needles laying around. It's you know bad for kids, bad for pets, it's bad for the environment. Um, it's also bad for people uh, suffering from substance use disorder. It's just bad all around. And so we want to do what we can also for our city workers who, who, are, who are dealing with it one way or the other. And we want to make sure we're doing what we can to increase their safety as well. So so process, so, th so this is, is the approach that is, is going to happen. So right now I'm kind of in the initial public input phase and so I'm, I'm talking to people and uh, especially in different areas of the city that I'm not getting to to get kind of a gauge on, on what the problem is, is like and also I'm as, as many ideas as people have I am, I am open. I'm hearing some really creative solutions um some some more plausible than others but it's uh all the ideas are are great um so what else i'm doing is i'm engaging with all of the different departments that even remotely come into contact with this issue because i think looking at all sides of it are incredibly important so after my public input phase, I will be meeting with departments, um, and then I will, and also while keeping my um, Parks Commission updated and uh, start looking into and researching um, research proven solutions, so see what other cities are doing that are comparable to Burlington. We'll also look at things that maybe haven't been implemented yet, um, but really taking kind of a research-based approach to this. I'll also be engaging um, 
towards the middle and end parts of this process with people currently suffering from substance use disorder and people in recovery, specifically people who uh, use needles in the course of their addiction because um, I think any solution, however feasible, is just really going to be limited um, in the success by the compliance of, of people who do uh, use needles. And I think a really important context is nobody has really figured this problem out. And a huge part of that is, is our country is being decimated by the op opioid epidemic. And we'll be talking more about that during our Narcan training. But this, I mean, if, and some of you, some of you are more experienced in this and have more exposure than others. But yes, the opioid problem is huge. It's huge in Vermont. It's very big in Burlington. And I think it's important to have grace with everybody, with, with the city, with each other, as we're trying to figure this out. There's no real good one-size-fits-all solution for the needle issue. If there was, we wouldn't have a needle issue. So, you know, this is going to take some time and, and patience to figure out, but it's an important thing to get started on. So after I kind of reached the point where it looks like we may have some possible solutions, then I will be engaging again with department heads in the city council and the mayor to look at what would even be feasible to be adopted in the city. Again, everything, money is always going to be a limiting factor. So, you know, I, I want to make sure we're not at the end presenting a possible solution that is just not going to work for the city. And then, um, and then, so the next step when when we reach a solution that looks like could be implemented and in, implemented by uh, the the city, what I'll do is I will write a resolution and present it to the Parks and Rec Commission and look to pass a resolution at the Parks and Rec Commission level. And then when we have a passed resolution at that level. Um, engage with NPAs, try to get more support for the resolution, and then at that point, present it to the city council. And at that point, my hope is to, when we're presenting a solution and a resolution to the city council, we have the research, we have budgets, we have engagement and support from all levels of the city. And at that point, I'm hoping that the council can then take it on and put it through whatever process they need to do, which I don't envy because I know it can be complicated. Um, so in the meantime, what can you do? For those of you who don't know about See Quick Fix, uh, the gentleman that just spoke spoke a little bit about it. It's an excellent app. There are so many problems you can address on it. So seequickfix.com or you can find it in your app store on your phone. And it's an app. I know Olivia's very experienced. Olivia keeps our neighborhood uh, pretty, pretty free of the, the transphobic stickers via the C Quick Fix app. It alerts city staff to a problem, whether it be a pothole, needles, uh, it, it could be um, garbage left on the side of the street. You can post a picture. And then that communicates to city staff, who will then use the the app to delineate that to the appropriate city staff. And you can also monitor it. It'll let you know when it's updated, when it's noticed by a city staff, and when it's resolved. It's a great app. It's also helpful, particularly with the needles, if people start using the C-Click Fix app more often, because that's going to help me in my data process and tracking um, where the needles are concentrated. And then also, um, please contact me. Uh, my email um, is L Morrigan. I'll spell that. So it's L M O R R I G A N at burlingtonvt.gov. That's my commission email. And yeah, and I'll also I, I'll hang around for a little bit after the meeting. And so I'm just looking to hear ideas, people's experiences. You can send me pictures. Like the more information the better. I'm, I'm a very data-driven person. And so we have eight minutes where if people want to ha uh, have first
first if there's questions about the process and then if we have time ideas or comments and eight minutes I'll open up the room <laughs> Sarah uh, just two comments um, just I can't really I, reiterate enough <laughs> about using C click fix it seems like a pain it, it is a little clunky but it is how we keep the data on all of these things so you can still send an email and that's fine but it, it, it compiles data I know the Parks Department is putting in more portalettes all around the city in the parks will there be sharps containers in those I don't know okay well I'm, <laughs> I, yeah. will, that I will I uh, will find out. I'm grateful to the Parks Commission for the more portalettes. <laughs> yeah. I guess this is just a small thought. I know that the library has been giving um, or has gun locks available for people. So maybe there's a way that you can work with the library to do something with that as well. Thanks. Oh, hi. Hi, everybody. Yeah, can you hear me? Um, I did just want to make sure that f I wanted to point to a bill that was actually passed in the House and the Senate this session called H-222, which is an act to reduce um, overdose overdoses. Um, and part of that bill is a syringe disposal um, program it, it's going to vastly increase the um, syringe disposals that we have in the state for those of you who travel up to Canada you can't go far without seeing that they have a really great syringe disposal program in almost all of their buildings and we're hoping to have that kind of an expansion but it's a bill that I would recommend you take a look at it's got a lot on um, uh, opioid uh, um, antagonists, for example, drug checking and so forth. But the goal is just to reduce and lower um, the amount of deaths that we've seen in, the, in this overdose um, opioid crisis. But um, it, it is exciting to have that kind of disposal program, to your point about the syringes. Thank, uh, you. Thank you for your, your work. Okay, um, Mar Martine, um, you said since that bill passed, does it have an act number? That As, uh, because that's easier to find right. passed bills by their act numbers. Yeah. Let me find out. I, okay. Um, right, I was just looking it up as H-222. Okay, so thank you. Act yet, All right. In the current session, in the legislative thing, they, they keep the bills for two years. So it, you can still get it by the bill now, and then it turns into an act. <laughs> Yeah, I, for now, I would just look, uh, search it as H-222. Yeah. Great. This is Sal again, Sal Millichamp. Um, I go to the UU Society, Unitarian Universalist, and it's located right down from Howard Safe Recovery. So that's where individuals are getting the needles, and then they often stop by the UU and then they use the needles and then they're left. Um, what we have finally done, it's taken a while, is to get the needle boxes and uh, put them up where people usually are using. And also we've worked very hard to connect with the individuals who are in need. So connecting with the, the people and also we have volunteers that regularly are picking up with the long arm pickup things and uh, you know we just we're signing up to do this to keep the grounds clean but it's everyone's job you know this is where we live these are our neighbors the people who are using our neighbors and we all need to work together for this but it has taken time but it is worth it and the Narcan is worth it too definitely Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, I, don't, I haven't been here that, or in Vermont for that long, but I'm wondering if anybody's ever talked about um, a needle buyback program or anything like that. Yes, actually, this, this gentleman here suggested it at a recent city council meeting. It's 
Uh, I mean, at this point, um, everything's on the table. I mean, it seems to me that it wouldn't be that hard to have these disposal containers that spit out a quarter or a nickel every time, and then it's an incentive to give it back, you know? Five cents if it has the little orange. Yeah, yeah. And, and if it's still full, well, all right, a little bit more. <laughs> That's a dollar. It's definitely, th that, it, it will, that will be investigated. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> Just for a point of information, Burlington um, staffs and supports a group called Comstat, which is really um, a group of the opioid treatment providers. They meet every month and talk about a lot of things, um, but it's, it's a group you certainly should connect with, and it, it's more treatment provider focused, but um, Scott pa Scott Pavick, I can't remember his name, is the coordinator. So he, he's a person through me or uh, any of us we can get some ideas to. So thanks. Yeah, great. And I think with that, we are ready to. There's one, actually one, one more gentleman in the green sweatshirt, and you've got two minutes. So. I, I just want to say thanks for. No, we're going to run your clock. Yeah, run. I just want to say thanks for taking the lead on this, Lee. As you know, the issue is particularly acute in City Hall Park. It's in my neighborhood. I'm over there a couple times a day or a couple times a week. And, uh, you know, we no longer walk the dog over in City Hall Park because we've had instances, too many close calls. And one of the things I see, particularly in summer months, I see the various preschools, I think, from the Y in different places coming through, through the park. Um, my big concern is, is not so much a question of if but when somebody comes into town um, to visit and they decide to have a picnic and they have a three or four year old toddler running around who just coincidentally happens to step on a, on a sharps and I think there's a significant liability for the city so I'm very glad to see that the Parks and Rec Commission uh, and you are taking this on. Thank you and thank you you've advocated for this at several meetings so I appreciate it. It's a team effort. Yes. <laughs> are we is Grace joining by Okay, so we're going to jump. We're going to jump around if it's okay. Our next presenter is going to join 15 minutes late. So if it's okay with Mr. Hooper and the rest of the um, legislature, we're going to move to legislature updates. All right, Bob said thumbs up. At least one of them. <laughs> Who would like to begin? Do you want to begin, Bob? Uh, I think that uh, Carol and I worked out a system last time where we sort of co-presented, and we might want to do that. Do you want to do that, Carol? Okay. Oh, Carol is here. Please come up. <laughs> Carol will have like detail, but I the thing that I would like to probably make the the biggest update about is that people are working on the motel program. Uh, it's incorporated in the budget. The budget is in danger of being vetoed. And at this point in time, there are a lot of Burlington representatives who aren't in a mood to vote for an override. That puts the school funding, uh, child care system, a whole bunch of stuff on the line. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the situation that I think we're looking at. Um, Carol has her papers with her, so I'm hoping she'll expand and expound. Okay, so um, we we passed a budget um, this session, and some of it, it will really help with some of the um, issues that we're going to be facing as the motel program ends. So during the pandemic, the federal government gave the states money to house people because it was very important that people be isolated and so forth. So that housing, um, that temporary housing, and we put a lot of people into motels has dried up and we've, um, we now have to figure out what to do next. So in the budget, we have $10 million going to the Department of Children and Families to help people experiencing homelessness. And that $10 million will be going out in flexible grants that enables um, people working 
with uh, people who are homeless, like the Department of Children and Families, to um, to respond to short-term needs. And those needs could be to give people a rental deposit so they can get into a new um, rental, help them with the furniture or car repair or transportation co costs, relocation expenses, anything to help people get into um, regular rental housing. It also um, gives $15.2 million to emergency rental assistance program funds for three years of housing stability wraparound services through community partners. So when I say community partners, it'd be things like the Howard Center, um, helping people to figure out how to stay in the housing that we get them, um, getting mental health services, if they're disabled, getting help with that, if they're older, getting meals on wheels, whatever people need to be able to um, stay in housing independently. And then millions more, like 1 million, 5 million, plus millions and millions more um, for voucher programs, rental subsidies, uh, family supported housing programs, um, for when the winter weather gets cold, um, for adverse winter. Uh, and so that's those are some of the things that are in this budget. Now, those kinds of funds could be going out now to start helping people now because uh, there are a couple of dates where people will start to have to leave the motel program, but um, uh, it looks like the governor would veto the budget. That means that we can't, the money will not start going out until we have a veto session. The veto session is scheduled if we need it for, and it looks like we'll need it for um, the 21st, 22nd or so of June. And so that's when we would hope to override the veto. Um, there is a lot that's good in that budget. Um, and we need to help uh, the places that are going to need the help the most, of course, are the cities um, around the state um, and some of the uh, places where uh, where the motels are located, Shelburne, Colchester, many in Rutland, many places around the state. So we need to uh, we need to have a budget. We can't afford not to have a budget. Do you want to say anything more about that, Bob? Well, just that, I mean, a lot of people are throwing blame around on this. It, it, the governor should have had a plan in place for this to end. We knew that the federal funding was coming to an end um, and basically saying, okay, the program's over, move out um, to the like, I think 3,000 or so people that are in the motel program um, is, is sort of untenable we'd like to do something else. But the other side of that coin is uh, for most of the motels that we are renting the rooms, they're costing about 150 bucks a night. So it's a tremendous amount of money for the state to take on. Um, and as, as Carol uh, illuminated there, there is a lot of money going out to other help, but just not permanent motel lodging. Um, I wish we did not lose the federal money, uh, but the federal program ended kind of puts us in a bind. So, Thank um, great. Thanks, Bob. I, I, someone just said, be sure to introduce yourself. I'm Carol Odie. Um, along with Bob, we represent the far new north, north end of Burlington. It's yes. called District 18 now. And um, and we, we are state reps in in uh, the state house. Okay, so um, I have a few highlights in the different areas that I can go over. Um, in agriculture, food, resiliency, and forestry, that's one of our committees, we have uh, the right to repair bill passed um, that will allow consumers to repair their own agricultural and forestry equipment. And that bill is pending in the Senate. It's a very important bill. Farmers lose crops. They lose all kinds of time when they can't repair their own machinery. Um, the organic dairy crisis, um, 
you'll see a lot of places you'll see organic uh, milk and our organic or organic products and our organic products here in Vermont were doing very well until other products flooded the market from huge huge organic dairy and huge organic uh, farms in other parts of the country. So in order not to lose more organic farms, um, we have some one-time emergency relief for those farmers, uh, often they're dairy farmers, and um, we that will prevent a lot of schools, a lot of, excuse me, a lot of farms from going under. Um, Bob, do you wanna say anything about that? Um, it, it, People have a tendency to, because we talk about farm equipment, uh, that's the first bite at the apple, I think, for self-repair. Uh, apple computers, your your iPhones, things like that are kind of closely guarded technology that the company doesn't let out. Um, so we're hoping that the right to repair your own stuff eventually expands. It's very hard to take a $300,000 tractor down to the John Deere dealer 200 miles away. Um, that's That was a priority this year. Mm. Yes, and as Bob said, that may expand to other things that you would like to repair in your homes and businesses. Um, universal school meals, during the pandemic, the federal government paid for universal school meals. That meant that not only do people who didn't have the money to buy their own meals get uh, free meals in school, but all kids did. Um, then Vermont said, okay, we'll expand that for one more year, um, which, uh, which the legislature did, and question. now the legislature um, has acted to uh, What's the current expand that purchase inventory of um, participants. Every year, the Do legislature will decide how that is paid money. for. And this year, they decided that it would be paid for at the education fund. It doesn't need to be paid for at the education fund, but that's what they decided to do. We decided to do last year. Um, uh, and uh, not only does that increase student participation, of course, in eating at schools, um, it it also allows our our um, meal planning at schools to mean that uh, our our uh, school meal services are buying more from Vermont farmers, and that's very good for Vermont farmers. And that is a huge thing for me. More and more, the most we can buy from Vermont, the better. And Bob? You know, we have Martine Gulick here, who's the state senator. Is she supposed to go this time, too? Oh, she's separate? Okay, all right. Am I separate? All right. <laughs> We have a small farm, di farm diversification grants, and that's to help small farmers improve their financial resilience by diversifying more. Martine, you can come up. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you just Thank you for that. Um, just down. rearranging our agenda on the fly? <laughs> People might as well, yeah, pop in. Absolutely. Okay, and so. Um, so we could talk a little bit about what's in the budget and what's important to all of us in the budget. Um, one thing that's in the budget is up to $16 million, 16 point maybe one or $2 million, we were able to secure to help our city take down and remove safely our high school that has PCBs in it. So that's a very big deal and um, we worked all of us so hard on that. So very excited That's about awesome. trying. <laughs> oh. That was quite the sort. I mean, that was a, a really, um, I'm rep state representative Emma Mulvaney standing. Sorry, this was at 8.30 and I was buzzing from another meeting in Montpelier. Uh, oh, I just want to say the Burlington now. delegation, so all 10 House members and our Senate account colleagues in the, over on the other chamber really worked hard to make sure that the state really understood the unique situation that Burlington High School was in uh, related to how things have been changing on PCBs and uh, I was just really proud of that moment of us all standing together regardless of party, regardless of, of um, differences on other issues because we really advocated for Burlington and, and conveyed how important this was that Burlington kids were Vermont kids and we really needed to collectively do this not only for Burlington but if another school were ever in a such an extreme situation that we would show up for that, that community as well. 
and as a matter of fact, really, um, most bills on the House floor are voted on unani unanimously or nearly unanimously, and most bills come out of committees unanimously or close to unanimously. What you read about in the paper is where we disagree. So just kind of take heart and know that people's voices are heard and we're working together on solutions to Vermonters' biggest problems. Um, so what's in this $8.4 billion budget? And why does it sound like so much? Well, we have a lot of one-time money. and. Uh, from the federal government, and thanks to Senator Patrick Leahy. So we have to spend some of that money quickly. We, we can't wait to appropriate it. It might take us some time to spend it, excuse me, but we have to definitely make plans for how we're going to appropriate it so we can get it out the door and get it spent on things that matter, um, like housing, um, expanding affordable housing. We have $109 million for that. $102 million for emergency shelter and support services for unhoused Vermonters, for recovering housing, recovery housing and transitional housing for Vermonters exiting prison and housing for young people uh, exiting foster care. We um, have raised provider rates. That almost $100 million in the budget for that. Um, that's boosting rates for primary and specialty care, dental care, home health care, nursing homes, residential care, adult day care, substance use and mental health, ambulance services, and more. So you can see big emphasis on older Vermonters. One in three Vermonters are older. We need help. Everybody. Um, and when we do the right thing in the professions then and serving Vermonters, then we can keep our emergency rooms free for emergencies and we save money that way too. Um, child care, very exciting. Um, we passed a multi-year transformation. We had employers come to us, we had employees come to us and please help us with child care. So we have to make it affordable for families. We have to make it raise rates to provide financial stability for child care providers and boost pay for valued early childhood workforce. We are losing people who are working in child care all the time. So um, does anybody want to take on some of the things I just said? Uh, that's, that's also a, a matter for Vermont to consider in terms of economic development. We probably all know somebody that has told the story of coming to the state not being able to find housing, not being able to find childcare, uh, and going back home. So these things that don't seem like they're that interrelated actually are. And the demographics of our state has a tendency to not change as quickly because we don't have as many facilities available for new people to come in, establish themselves, and get on with their life here in this beautiful state. Um, so that's another reason child care is in the budget, um, you know, that it's important that this gets passed. I know you have about 10 minutes left on your agenda item, just oh. so you can, I know it's so flying I'm by. <laughs> my colleagues will speak to some of the things that they want to speak to in the budget or address some of the things I've talked about. I was going to talk about child care. Sure. <clears throat> I just want to mention on child care because one of the reasons I actually ran for office, I have a, a three-year-old and an eight-year-old, and just so folks know what that actually looks like for working families, we're going to increase the subsidy, which is called CQ back, um, from uh, for families to receive 100% subsidy, so free child care will go up to 175% of the federal poverty measure, so that's more than what we offer now. So this is why this is such a big critical investment, but the additional part of that is that we'll then have a tiered process um, for other families up to 400% of federal poverty measure, which is upwards to about $105,000 per household. And while that seems high, many Vermont working families are spending something upwards to 20, 25% of their income if they have more than one kid in a childcare center. And as we know, because the ratios that we all value, that's not going into the pockets of early educators. So the other side of this is that we're putting significant investments, as Carol was saying, into early educators, which are largely women. It's a care uh, economy job, which sector which has been undervalued for years. So I was incredibly proud that we put that together. Um, it had a uh, really significant um, uh, amount of support in the House and Senate. 
uh, and I think it's such an incredible investment. We also continue to get more early educators into that field, something we started last biennium, which is continuing to invest in the loan forgiveness programs for folks who want to go into that field, because obviously student debt is going to be a huge barrier for anyone going into any field, but we want to make this as easy as possible to go into this sector that we're significantly investing in. Um, so I'm really proud of that one. I want to just briefly go back to the housing piece budget because this is a critical thing facing Burlington and the whole state and I know Councillor Carpenter asked um, at least uh, us to address this. While we have a lot of significant investment in affordable housing within the big budget, $8.4 billion um, budget, um, we have a we, we missed something. We missed something really significant about the, at the ending of the motel voucher program under the general emergency housing program. And this is actually why I voted, ultimately voted no against the budget, as did about um, 17 or so of us, progressives and Democrats for that matter. And I'm not going to make this partisan, but I want to flag the reason we were so concerned and had to vote no is that we are headed towards, I will use the word crisis. We have about 2,000 households, which includes 700 children, about to be evicted from this motel program, um, May 31st and June 30th, um, without a just transition for these folks. And what's going to happen is that communities like Burlington are gonna be the receiving end, and we don't have the support systems and our own resources ready to stand up really, I think, a livable situation for these folks. And so what we're trying to call for is that there's still time in this process to fix this piece. It's one a relatively small piece within an $8.54 billion budget to come up with a much more humane um, and supportive response for these Vermonters, most of which are Vermonters. They're not from out of state. Most are from Vermont, uh, right here in Vermont. So I think this was a really missed piece. Um, it's not just on the governor, it's on us in the legislature, and I really hope that we take this seriously and bring advocates to the table and really come up with solutions so that we're not facing um, a significant issue back here in Burlington and in Montpelier and in Rutland and Brattleboro, uh, where these 2,000 households are just pushed out into tents and sleeping bags. That's, that's essentially what this, the temporary solution is, and that's not a solution. Um, that's not a humane solution. So I wanted to flag that. If people want to talk more about that um, offline, separately, I can stick around, but I'm significantly concerned about this and I wanted to flag that for people in Burlington in particular. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Hi everybody, Martine Gulick. Uh, I am senator for Chittenden Central, one of three senators for the Chittenden Central District. Happy to be here tonight. Um, I did want to follow up on a few things. One was the uh, child care. I'm, I serve on both uh, health and welfare and education, so the child care bill was a big part of the work that I did this year. And um, I did just want to let folks know that in the end, child care ended up getting sort of split into two parts. One, which is the birth to three, which is child care. And another, which is, um, sorry, birth to two, really, because three and four-year-olds end up getting placed in pre-K or early education. And that part of the child care landscape was actually um, sent over to the education committee and will be part of a study for the upcoming year. So what we wanted in the initial bill called S-56 was really to place more um, pre-K students in public schools because there's a lot of capacity right now with declining enrollment and this demographic cliff that we're heading toward, we actually have a lot of capacity in our public schools and we were hoping that we'd be able to um, place more four-year-olds in, in schools. Um, however, folks weren't comfortable with making that shift quite so quickly, so it will be a study, but we're hoping at the end of the day that we'll be able to find a way to place more students in our schools while also making sure that we um, help those folks who do have private businesses um, in any way that we can. So I did want to bring that up. Um, just to echo the housing situation, it was it's great that it's been brought up tonight. Um, we had an amendment in the Senate that was brought forth by two of my colleagues, Senator Vihovsky and Senator Hashim, and um, that was an amendment to the budget to find funds to um, continue housing folks until a more permanent solution was found. Sadly, only about five of us voted for that, so it did not move forward. Um, but it is, it's going to be, this is going to be a problem that's going to really face our cities and not so much the rural areas of the state. Um, so I agree, it's important to speak to um, your, your representatives, your senators, the governor. Um, unfortunately, this has become like a reactionary moment for us, even though we've known that this was gonna end. So it is a shame that we didn't put more programs in place 
um, so that our cities like Burlington um, doesn't have to bear the brunt of what will potentially be a crisis. Just want to add to that is that in other states, um, in other states, the governors have figured out how to transition from the motel from the pandemic housing to what happens next, and they've done that in different ways. And right now, um, the legislature has had to step up. And, and, and work on this in a different way than they might normally. Um, the, the head of our House and Human Services Committee, Representative Teresa Wood, is starting weekly meetings with the Agency of Human Service leadership. Uh, we're gonna have a small group of members from across the state join her. And um, there is a new feedback form for the Agency of Human Services. So if you, if you are a community provider or uh, a town, someone in the town, city council, whatever, I don't know how you're going to organize it, but if you need something and you're hitting barriers, we'll gather that information quickly in an organized way and make sure it's addressed and we'll be getting that form. This reminds me of what happened during the pandemic when the Department of Labor was not getting out unemployment. Two minute warning checks. Oh, okay. To, to, uh, to people who needed them in the, and, and pandemic unemployment assistance. And it was, it was blamed on the computer system, but I ended up being one of the people who volunteered to help Vermonters get their money. And we had about 30 of us, 35 of us, and we, um, we helped, I don't know, like 3,500 or 4,000, I can't remember anymore, Vermonters get what they needed just by talking to people and getting their social security, last four digits of social security, their names, their cell numbers or their phone numbers, and their stories. Yeah. Anyway, all right, I'll just quickly say, and we were able to really help with that a lot, and this is what we're, we're doing again. We're stepping in where, where it hasn't been done. Yay. There's just one other brief thing, because I know it's been brought up here before. So different topics, so hang with me, I'll do it in 30 seconds. So gun control and the common sense gun policy has been brought up in this MPA before. So we had two bills move forward, um, H-230 and S, which Martin can maybe fill in my brain here. But H-230 had um, a chunk of different pieces, including now there'll be a, we'll see what the governor does, of course, right? But a three-day waiting period, 72 hours before purchase. Um, it will be safe storage required in the state of Vermont that's incredibly important for children and a number of issues related to suicide and easy access to guns. Expanding what's called red flag laws, um, which is the emergency response protective orders to allow family members to also start that process. That was not the case under current law. And, um, uh, oh, I thought there was a third thing. That was it. The thing that did not, it was not included, which I tried to put into the mix based on Burlington's charter change attempt about eight years ago, was to add barring guns in places that serve alcohol. It was a charter change we passed eight years ago that went nowhere in the legislature. That was not picked up. So I did attempt to bring that back into the conversation, but that did not pass. Our four charters, since I seem to be the queen of charter changes in Burlington, and letting you all know about <laughs> yes. them, they're related to elections, ranked choice voting for all elections locally, um, all resident voting, and then some boundaries and polling locations. Those bills are now in the hands of the governor, and he has to act within about the next three or four days based on the, when he got those bills. So we should have an answer, and in theory, unless he vetoes it, um, we should be able to be in place for next March, those election changes. So stay tuned. Sorry. Perfect timing. We don't. Yeah, I'll, I'll just use my prerogative as a member of the steering committee. No, uh, thank you so much. We, I feel that we uh, have done you all a disservice for all the work that you've done, and we've given you such little time. Just a very, very quick question uh, in how we can help you. What was the timing of the governor's veto for the funding bill? Um, he has until Saturday. Saturday? Just Saturday. He needs to hear from us before Saturday. Well, he's, yes. If he, yes. Okay. He has until Saturday to make a decision. It might be tomorrow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jeff? Um, <clears throat> I need to speak on behalf or uh, uh, folks who are not always a fan of everything that the legislature <laughs> works on or accomplishes. Um, got 30 seconds. And, I, and so my, my cons so with that context, my concern is about the timing of the veto session. And Unfortunately, it sounds like that's going to occur before our next NPA meeting. And my question is, 
<clears throat> is, is it necessary that the budget, when you go back to the veto session, does the budget pa package have to pass as one big package the way it is and have this brinkmanship fight about the housing program or is it possible to split out parts of that budget and pass those funding measures separately so that this doesn't turn into a all or nothing uh, con contest the way it's being framed now because there's stuff in there that I appreciate and there's stuff in there that I don't and I in a but the budget is a bill so it would be override based on the, the veto of the bill not individual components there is no line item sort of veto here okay but when when you go back into live session is it possible to split parts of that budget bill apart New bills can be introduced, but they have to go through the whole process, which is three readings, other chamber, three readings, back and forth. So it's tricky. It's okay, tricky. so it's my, uh, yeah, okay, so as I, I said, it's in. my. I've got a lot of pressure to just cut it off. Okay. So I'm going to move on. I it's a long apologize. answer. Apologize. Thank you very much, I'm Matt. It's a long answer. Hot seat tonight. Thank you, and we're sorry. We're out of time. Thanks, folks. Yeah, we have one more presenter. A certain amount of time for us. Training. So I'm going to skip now to Grace Keller, who is from the overdose prevention, or actually the Howard Safe Recovery regarding overdose prevention, and we're going to talk about <coughs> Narcan training and information. Grace, I'll give it over to you. Hi. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Um, I'm going to speak really quickly because usually this is a 40-minute training, um, but I will also <clears throat> give you all my email if there are any questions and feel free to reach out, we can also set a time to talk. It's really important. Um, I'm Grace Keller. I was the program coordinator at Howard Center Safe Recovery for, I worked there for 15 years. Um, I would love to take one quick second too and say that what they're talking about with housing is a real thing and it's actually devastating. I hadn't been in Burlington in a long time. I've worked in homeless case management for years um, and, and we really need to look at this. It's, com it's compassion. It's going to affect everybody. So I'll move on, but thank them for, um, for their hard work on this. It's, it's not, it, it should not be an option. Um, so, uh, Narcan is a nasal spray. It reverses the effects of opioid overdose and gets the person breathing again. It's an incredibly safe medication. It was, um, FDA approved in 1960. So it's been around for a long time. Um, and it was used in emergency rooms and ambulances. Um, in 2013, Vermont made it legal for me to, for the health department to provide it to people like me and for me, me to be able to provide it to anyone who might be present at an overdose. Um, we've had people, clients walking through the UMO and found somebody overdosed that they didn't know in their car and opened the door and saved their life with Narcan. So unfortunately, with the state of things right now in Vermont, um, we are all on, um, at risk for finding somebody who is overdosed. So I can give it to any of you. She has Narcan there. Um, I also have given out, we've given out 38,000 doses out of safe recovery. So don't hesitate to reach out to me personally. If you need more, you have somebody you're worried about, you have a group of people you're worried about. We really want to get this to everybody. Um, it's incredibly safe. So I'll talk a little bit quickly about how, how it is safe and what it does. Also, I'm, I'm not used to talking this fast, so sorry about that. But um, also, I will talk about um, how to recognize signs and motors and how to administer. Um, so Narcan, we all have opioid receptors in our brains. An overdose is just a flooding of those receptors. So they fill up, they spill over. And the brain shuts down and it stops telling the body to breathe. So an opioid overdose is not actually a heart attack. It's, it's um, respiratory distress and loss of brain function. The reason this medication is so safe is that the only job it has is it has a stronger affinity to those receptors. So it goes in and binds to them and kicks the opioids off. And then the brain resumes normal activity. <clears throat> I did the majority of the testimony for the uh, um, overdose prevention Narcan bill in the in the house in the House and Senate in 2012 and 2013. Um, so I called Poison Control and asked them, like, what happens if a kid gets a hold of this? Because that's what we would all worry about is medications and kids. 
Um, and they said, you don't have to do anything because again, this, this medication only has one job. It goes in and it binds to those receptors. So A, if a kid gets it, we obviously don't want kids to get anything they shouldn't be getting, but it's like get spraying a liquid up their nose or wherever a kid sprays it. Um, and also, if you give it to someone who's not overdosing, but you think they are, it's not going to hurt them. So it's worth the chance and it's worth the attempt if they're, if if you have somebody that is unconscious and um, and unable to respond to you. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like and how to recognize that. But I always like to talk about the safety first because it is an incredibly safe medication. Um, it's in, it's, it's very, um, it's been used for a long time. And again, poison control, if you call them and say, my kid drank four Dr. Peppers, they're like, oh, better get them checked out at the emergency department for them to say nothing. You have, you don't have to do anything. It's incredibly safe. So, um, I have administered it also over 20 times. So we can talk about that again. You'll have my email, um, but it is in very safe. One of the other things I'll hit the myths um, up front too, is that there's a, a people, there's a lot of talk about people coming up frustrated, mad, potentially, um, even sometimes people talk about violence. Um, that is not what happens with the nasal spray. Uh, we have had 1800 people come back to say they've used it to save a life. We do a survey with all of those people. We've never had anyone report combative. We've never had anybody report that they were physically assaulted or even attempted physically assault. When I've done it, the person looks like what you see when somebody's fainted. They wake up, they're confused. They don't know why you're there. Um, and sometimes they get afraid because uh, the, this pop, pop, uh, people who use drugs often have fear or trauma around law enforcement. And we'll talk about Good Sam um, in this talk too. But um, really what it is, is a time for compassion, just like any other medical intervention. I've had family members who woke up from other um, diabetic shock and things like that. And they're, you know, struggling or angry or, so this is just like any other intervention and it's a time for compassion. It's also a time to really look at stigma when people talk about how people react to a medical situation. But I can tell you, I've never seen it. I've never seen anyone come close to it. I have seen fear. Um, and I think that's when we can talk about the good Sam law and tell people that they're safe um, and they're immunized. And we'll get to that point. Um, so Narcan is a nasal spray. It comes in a box like this. Um, it has an expiration date on the top. It has an expiration date on the actual device. Um, the best practice is to get stuff that's not expired. But if all you had was something that has expired, you can go ahead and use it. Um, it won't be uh, it's not going to hurt somebody. It, they, they, it may not even be weaker is what they're finding. Um, but, and in, on the direction, on the box and in the device, in the packaging for the device, there are directions. I tell people to become comfortable with them at a time that's not an emergency, because if you look at the directions, they're actually more complicated than the device. The device is a nasal spray. Um, they're there if you need them. They're in the packaging if you need them. Um, I just know that I've now graduated to readers. The last thing you need is another barrier when it is a nasal spray. Um, and it's pretty self-explanatory and intuitive if, if even if you didn't know what you were what you were looking at. So the box comes with two doses. I take the doses out and put them in my bag. That's fine. I just would always keep at least two doses together. And if you're high risk, or work at a program at high risk around a lot of people, you may want to consider keeping more doses because unfortunately, even in Burlington, we've had tragedies where two people have overdosed at the same time. Um, so, but to keep the two doses together, it's just best practice. It's what the manufacturer wants you to do. Um, so I'm going to show you how to use it. Then we'll show you how to recognize the sign because I think this is what really um, demystifies it for people. Um, so you just take it out of this little plastic packaging. It has a tab, so it's very easy to pull. And it looks like this. It looks like a regular nasal spray. You just put your fingers on either side of the um, part here, and you push it up the person's nose, and you spray. And what's nice about it is there is some resistance. You might have heard that click. Um, so it won't just go off if you if you touch it lightly. And it will also deliver the entire dose. So you don't have to worry about dosing. Each one of these is one dose and there's two doses in a bag, in a package. Um, and the reason that's important is that 
if you give the first dose and nothing happens or very little happens in two to three minutes, you continue to give another dose and you can give doses every two to three minutes until help arrives. Now, this is a very scary situation. If that happens, you might feel the tendency to go quicker than two to three minutes. Ideally, we want people to wait because it is being absorbed through the mucous membrane. And if you go really quickly and put a bunch of doses up the person's nose, it will come out as a liquid and it will not get absorbed. Um, but again, it's going through the mucous membrane and it's getting the opioids off those receptors. So how we recognize signs of an overdose, that's another piece that I know that is um, concerning for people. Again, one of the nice things is, is that if you give it to someone who's not overdosing, you're not gonna hurt them. Um, so I would say try it, but we'll talk about it too. Um, and in Burlington, again, we're talking about homeless population, um, but you're also talking about we're having different populations of people. There's an increase in elderly overdose um, because people are prescribed opioids and they take more than, by accident, take more than they have. I know when I have antibiotics, there's times where I'm like, did I take this today? Um, so, you know, it's a good practice just to, for everybody to be aware of the signs of overdose and how to use Narcan. Um, Overdose often can look like sleeping. So if it's somebody you're worried about, wake them up from their nap. They may be annoyed at you for that, probably, but it, it, it is good practice to check, especially if it's somebody that you're that that there's a reason to be concerned. Um, but the other telltale signs is somebody can look like they're sleeping, their finger lips turn blue, fingernails turn blue, low or shallow breathing, because it and um or a gurgling sound. Those are all times that you should be, you could be concerned about an overdose. And again, those seem very um, simple and easy to see, but it's worth, um, you know, just going through these very deliberate steps so that people feel like they feel confident on how they would respond to an overdose. Um, I give people really deliberate steps because I think sometimes it gets overwhelming. And if you do these steps in order or out of order, you're still really moving towards getting somebody help rather than if you get overwhelmed and not do any. So I really wanna keep the steps deliberate. If you come upon somebody, your concerns overdose, lips turn blue, fingernails turn blue, they don't look right, they're in a different position, they're sleeping in a place they wouldn't be. Um, you just say, the, say something to them quite loud, try and wake them up just by talking to them. Hey, 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 if they don't respond to that, you can um, take your knuckles, look just like this in a fist and rub them on their chest bone. And you, if you rub it on your own chest bone pretty hard, you can feel it's a pain sensor. You wanna rub it hard enough or you can do it under the nose um, and you wanna rub it hard enough. Um, and if they don't respond to that, it means they're non-responsive and you can give them Narcan. The reason that I say Keep it, we keep it very simple from the health department's perspective and training. It, we don't want people to have to get into whether there's a pulse, because again, it's respiratory and, and um, distress, not necessarily the heart distress. Um, we don't want people to have to guess a lot. It's really about whether they're able to respond to you or not. If they can sit up and say, I'm fine, and then go back, even if they go right back to sleep, they may need medical care, but they don't need Narcan yet. It's if they cannot respond to you is when you would go ahead and give them Narcan. Um, so again, very simple, rub the chest bone or under the nose. And if they don't respond, you can give them Narcan. Now, the next step is pretty deliberate also. If you are the only person there, we tell people to give Narcan first and then call 911 because it gets the, the medication working in the system. Again, if you do the other way around, um, getting those steps done is really important. But if you... Um, uh, I would... If you're the only one there, give the first dose. It doesn't take very long and then call 911. In Vermont, we have this amazing law, speaking of our legislators, um, it was the best of um, law in the country at the time. It's called the Good Samaritan 911 law. If you call um, if you call 911, in the case of a drug overdose, the person overdosing and anybody helping them cannot be charged with a drug crime in the state of Vermont. So they can't be charged with possession of any amount, sales of any amount, delivery, which means I gave it to you or you gave it to me, but we didn't exchange money even if the person does not survive. They also can't violate probation, parole, house arrest, restraining order, or conditions of release. 
So really what the health, the legislature did that year was focus on saving a life um, and, and really getting people to call for help. So it's the person who's overdosing and anybody helping them. And it also includes underage drinking. So if you think about college kids who are afraid to call for help. Um, but what it means is that if we're all at a party and somebody overdoses, you know, um, the the automatic response we, we are hoping for will be that people will feel comfortable calling for help. And it means that if we call, if if there's an overdose, we can all work together and immunize ourselves and help the person. So if I give Narcan and one of you all gives um, calls 911 and one of you all does rescue breathing and somebody's out flagging down the ambulance, all of us, including the victim, are immune from um, prosecution for that long list of stuff. There are exceptions. If the person is in the car, a driver's seat of the car and the car is on, they can be given a DUI and, and may. Um, or if there's there are children present and that person is um, responsible for caring for those children, they DCF can be called. Um, DCF could be called if there were children present anyway. Um, and there could be charges about uh, um, you know, the effect of, that that might have on a child. Um, but other than that, we went really broad to really focus on the idea that we need to save a life and, and call for help. Um, so that's a lot of information all at once. Um, I want to also do a short video on rescue breathing. Again, this is like the quickest I've ever done a training, but I also think if we do that really quickly, we can have some time for questions um, storage wise, you want to store it at room temperature as best you can. You can store it. Um, it can go in high and low temperatures. It just shouldn't be stored in, um, uh, high and low temperatures. Like for, unfortunately for Vermont, that means the car is not, um, an option. Uh, our cars are room temperature, like two day, two days out of the year. So, um, we really, it should be, and if, if it's, if it's someone who's homeless or spends a lot of time outside, I tell them an outside pocket in the summer and inside pocket in the winter. Again, we're not sure that it affects it. Um, and it's better than nothing. Absolutely. Um, but that's what the manufacturer is saying currently. So, um, I'm going to share my screen, show a quick video, and then we can ask for quick questions. Also, my email is just gracek at howardcenter.org. You won't shock me. If you're thinking it's someone else's, you can ask me anything. You can tell me it's private. I won't share it. I don't share them anyway. Um, but I just want people to feel really safe and comfortable asking questions. These are really important issues. Um, okay, so we're going to share my screen, hopefully. and. Um, Okay, this is a very like one minute video basically, and I can put it in the chat afterwards. It's, it's just about how to do rescue breathing. Chest compressions in an overdose situation. Helping a person breathe by doing rescue breaths and chest compressions is important to keep the brain alive during an overdose. These steps may also be taken if you have given naloxone to a person who is overdosed and are waiting for the medication to take effect. These are the signs you should look for before beginning rescue breathing and chest compressions. The person is unconscious and not waking up. They don't respond to shouting or rubbing knuckles on the breastbone or between their upper lip and nose. They are not breathing normally. To begin rescue breathing, if the person is not breathing, follow these instructions. Open the person's airway by placing one hand on the forehead and the other hand on the bony part of their chin. Gently tilt the head backward, slightly lift the chin. Make sure their airway is clear. Pinch the person's nose shut and cover their mouth with yours. Take a regular, not a deep breath. Give one rescue breath for one second. Give a second rescue breath for one second. You will know you have given enough air when you see the person's chest begin to rise with the breath you give. As soon as you see chest movement, stop that breath. Be careful not to give too much air. If the person's chest doesn't rise on the first breath, try repositioning the head or the airway and trying another breath. To give chest compressions, follow these instructions. 
Once you have given two rescue breaths, do 30 chest compressions. Here's how. Place the heel of one hand on the center of the person's chest. This is the lower half of the sternum. Place the heel of the other hand on top of the first hand so that the hands are overlapped and parallel. Push hard and fast, two inches deep for anyone over the age of one. Allow the chest to fully return to normal position after each compression. For every two rescue breaths, give 30 chest compressions. Within the space of a minute, you should give between 100 and 120 compressions. For guidance, try to imagine giving compressions to a normal beat of row, row, row your boat. Keep doing rescue breathing and chest compressions. Stop if the person begins to breathe normally on their own, they regain consciousness or wake up, you are exhausted and can't continue. EMS, police, or other trained first responders arrive and take over care. Although the risk is low, mouth-to-mouth -mouth rescue can transmit infectious diseases. Consider your own safety before providing assistance. Devices such as a pocket mask or face shield are designed to protect you while you deliver rescue breathing and should be used according to the manufacturer's recommendations. The Good Samaritan Law provides some legal protections to anyone who gives. Okay, I uh, I got that last part in already. So, um, are, am I there? Can you all see me? Yeah. Oh. Okay, there I am. Right. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, if you don't have Narcan, it's important to call nine one one as quickly as possible because any. Um, Ambulance in the state after 2013, any ambulance in the state will have it. Um, also any um, police in the state other than, I, there's one um, police department somewhere in Southern Vermont that doesn't, but Burlington police, whoever gets there first will have Narcan. Um, so uh, if you don't have it, definitely, um, definitely give them a call as quick as possible, 911. Um, and also what I wanna say really quickly is you can give extra doses every two to three minutes. Um, it may not look good for a little while. Uh, what I can tell you is that because of fentanyl and that maybe I'll come back another time and talk about fentanyl, um, it's a very powerful opioid. It can take multiple doses. What I don't want people to do is give up. So just keep doing the dosing. I also understand that some people aren't capable of doing rescue breathing, um, which is why I really was deliberate with the other steps. If you can't get down on the ground or you can't do, you, you have breathing issues or there's some reason why you can't, then make sure that you're calling 911 and doing um, doing the nasal spray part. As as um, as you know, I think people can get scared and not do any of them. So that's why I want to just be very deliberate. Sorry to spew all this all at you, but I'm I'm passionate about this. If you can't tell, so feel free to email me. Um, I do see a hand over here. If I also don't know how, if 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 I can go over, do we want to just grab Robert's question real quick, or how do we do this? Uh, not really a question, uh, just uh, congratulating Grace. Excellent presentation. Uh, two weeks ago, I had a friend who uh, went into her daughter's room and found her in that blue condition, did not have anything available at the time to help her, and she died. Uh, so when you walk out of the room, pick up a couple of those things because you never know when you're going to be the person who is there. It might be your neighbor out in the front yard yelling. It might be somebody you run into on the street or an airplane or some other place, but um, you can't do something if you don't have something. So get something. Thanks. I'm so sorry to hear that, Robert. And and what you're saying is true. It's it's a very easy, It's there's a lot of stigma around it, but it's a very easy thing to do, to carry, to have. Um, and it's a nasal spray. If all you do is spray the nasal spray up somebody's nose, you are getting them well on their way. You also don't want to be in a position where you don't have um, access to this very safe medication. Um, but I'm 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 horribly sorry to hear that. And um, in Vermont, we are I I can I could talk about this all night, so I won't. But um, I I've been at my job for 15 years, and we're losing people at such a high rate. It's it's mm -hmm. really. 
preventable. Um, but I can come back another time. I could also yammer on about the housing piece. Um, and so, um, again, I'm not supposed to get too political, but that is critical. And I think we are already, I mean, the effects are going to be a, a, a wave of um, devastation that's going to start coming very, very quickly, if not, and, and already has. So, sorry. Um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not bringing all that much hope sometimes, but I'm just being really direct. So, well, we're pretty deep in the hole. Yeah. <laughs> and we have ways out. I, I had a, two questions. Where can we get, um, Narcan, if, if you're not here tonight, okay. where would you? There's, um, I think they did pass some out. If there's not enough, um, email me yes. and I'll bring it to your house. Yes, I'm going to go get it. And this is more of a suggestion for you. Or I think every business, public business, should have it in their first aid kit. In the last month, there's, there's two overdoses in Hannaford's right down our road. So I, I, I hope on the public side, we can get businesses to keep it. And then I just, if I want to tell my neighbor where to get it, where can they get it? Oh, so this is great. If you go on the health department's website, especially if you have a friend that's in another part of the state, they can just type their address in and they'll tell them the closest spot. It is in pharmacies, but you'd have to pay for it. And there's a lot of places to get it for free. So, um, but uh, that's the other piece. I'll tell you really quickly, 35% of the people that have died um, in the last social autopsy we did were um, restaurant workers and construction workers. So I am doing a focus towards them. So if anybody has any connections, I'd love to get in. Um, those are Department of Labor statistics. So we know that that's dramatically underreported. I worked in restaurants for years. I'm saying it publicly. I was never on the books. My partner was a carpenter. He always struggled to find places to be on the books. Um, so we we know what populations we're losing, but I do agree with businesses. It's um It's a really safe and easy thing to have. Sounds like it maybe should be part of the needle exchange network. It, it is. That's where I come from, um, yeah. is the syringe exchange. So, get a needle, get an Arcan. Yeah, yep, exactly. Um, and so, yes, and if anybody else has any questions, also, if you don't feel comfortable getting it tonight, reach out to me and we'll find a confidential way to do that. Um, you know, again, I've given out over 30,000 doses, so I don't even notice don't you know don't feel any shame around coming to me about that one more question in the back of the room i just want to say thank you for putting the training on i think this is incredibly important and i will definitely take you up on your offer for some narcan uh, one thing i did want to point out i have family members who have had the opportunity to administer narcan here in the city and one of the things that came as a bit of a shock and surprise to me is not everyone is really happy that you gave them narcan because you just ruined their high and I have talked to a number of people who have had to administer Narcan and have actually been verbally and physically assaulted afterwards. So once you administer Narcan, make sure to take a step back and, you know, be prepared to get yelled at. And, but, you know, at the end of the day, take satisfaction, know that you saved someone's life and that's the most important thing. And um, thank you again for your work. Thank, thank you so much. And again, um, I don't know if you were here when we talked about that part of the presentation and the statistics that we see, um, we've had 1800 people come back and say they've used it. We have not seen that. So um, I'd be happy to talk to somebody who went through that. I'd love to um, help and, and you know, hear their experience because I do these trainings all the time. So feel free to give them my email too. Giving out my email to everybody. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I, I need to hear those stories. Like I said, I've been working on this a long time. So um, if, you know, I've never seen it or heard it, but I, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. And I want to make sure that I... Um, and reflecting those experiences accurately. So feel free to give anybody my email. Um, but I like your message that let's keep people alive too. Thank you, Grace. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. I'm I'm really happy to be here. I appreciate it. Um, Thank you for the, so much for the work you do. I think this work has exponential life-saving potential. Um, I'm only here because people interrupted my death uh, 15 years ago and now I help others and the people that you instruct save others who will save others. So thank mm -hmm. you for putting that into the world. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, I can tell you that Safe Recovery has 5,000 clients and um, they are, you know, the most resilient, powerful people that um, is a silent population in the community that we don't see and we don't know their stories. But 
Um, some of the stories that you hear and then you see them getting out of a tent and going to work or going to get their um, methadone or even getting out of a tent to you know, go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I know I have a client who's in her 60s and is a female. Like the, the resiliency in this population is not anything you have ever seen until you start, you know, stopping and talking and being compassionate to people. And I'm sure everybody is. I just, um, the stigma is really devastating. And um, so I think, you know, uh, the accomplishments that some of these people have and the stories that they have, um, you know, are things that we would never imagine um when you're when you're seeing what's going on in Burlington right now so um thank, thank you, you all for being the ones that are interested came and and I'm happy to to meet up with anybody last thing Robert there is a group support group for parents it's called team sharing Vermont and I think it's on Facebook um it was started by Kimberly Blake who's a doctor in in the area that lost her son and I know that that group I've worked with that group they really get a lot of power and support from each other so um, I think even the hospital gives out her cell phone. So it's a really, um, a, you know, a horrible thing to have happen. But I think also the only, one of the best times for having somebody else who's been there. Um, so feel free to tell your friend about that or have them connect to me and I will. Thank um, you. So sorry. Um, all right. Well, thank you all. And uh, sorry to keep you. I know it's late. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Grace. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.